And the heat energy actually resides in the movement of the atoms and molecules which make up the substance which is hot. So if the air is warm, that's because the individual molecules which are in the air are vibrating. As the air cools down, the reason the air appears cooler to us is because the molecules which compose the air are vibrating less vigorously. There is less energy in that molecular vibration. Conversely, if you warm the air up, the reason the air appears warmer to us is because the molecules which make up that air are vibrating more vigorously. The molecules have more heat energy. This is called the kinetic understanding of heat. The kinetic understanding of heat. So if we have an individual water molecule, for example. When the water is relatively cool, the magnitude and the energy involved in the molecular vibration will be relatively small. It will just be vibrating a little bit. But then as we warm the water up, we put in more heat energy. The individual molecules composing the water will have a greater amount of kinetic energy. They will be vibrating to a greater amount, something like this. And hence the vibrating water molecules will contain more heat energy. So heat is the molecular vibration or the atomic vibration of the microparticles composing the individual piece of matter. And this actually explains why heat can be conducted through a conductor of heat. You might remember that some substances are good conductors of heat, such as metals. Other substances, such as wood and plastic, are poorer conductors of heat. But if you think of a strip of metal, for example, think of a strip of copper. Suppose this is a strip of copper here. And this is made up of individual copper atoms. Much smaller than this, of course, but the individual copper atoms are composing the piece of copper. And when the copper is cold, these atoms will be, will they be vibrating quickly or slowly when the copper is cold. When the copper is cold, they will be vibrating slowly. But suppose I'm to warm the copper up and I put a flame under this end of the copper. So there's a gas flame under the copper, heating it up. Now energy from the flame is going to start atomic vibration in the atoms which compose the copper strip. And these are going to start vibrating. So they're going to start vibrating. And as this one vibrates, it's going to bump into the next one. And just like if you're walking along and you bump into someone, then they move as well as you. So that one will start vibrating and that will start this one vibrating, which will start this one vibrating. And I think you can see that the vibration from this one is going to be spread along into that one, and from that one into that one, and from that one into that one. And so the molecular vibration that is put in by this heat here is going to spread all the way along the copper bar. So the heat is going to progress all the way along here. And then if you come and touch that end of the copper bar, copper being a particularly good conductor of heat, well, you're going to burn your fingers. Now, the next thing we need to understand about heat is it can be transferred from one object to another via one of three mechanisms. Now, heat always travels from hot objects to cold objects, never the other way around. It's always the heat that transfers to the cold. And heat can be transferred via conduction, convection and radiation. Conduction, convection and radiation, the three mechanisms of heat transfer, which we now need to try and understand. Now the first mechanism of heat transfer I want to talk about is conduction. And really the example we've just looked at is an example of conduction. But if you touch an object which is cold, for example on a cold morning you might touch a metal object, 
and the heat is transferred directly out of your body into something else. So if the person here touches something which is cold, there's direct contact between the person and the cold object, then the heat can be transferred directly from the warm body into the cold object. This will work whenever objects colder than the surface of the body come into contact with the body surface. Heat will be lost directly by conduction. Now there is a certain amount of heat which is lost by conduction into the air. Not actually very much though, because the air is actually a good insulator of heat. So normally only something like 3% of the total amount of heat loss will be lost by conduction into the air. Now, if a person is immersed in water, the story is very different. Because air is a very good insulator of heat, the air is not transferred from the body out into the air effectively by conduction. So that means even if, it's so, if someone is in air which is a lot colder than body temperature, even without clothes, they can stay relatively warm. But in water the situation is quite different because water is a relatively good conductor of heat. So if someone is immersed in cold water, they can lose a lot of body temperature really quite quickly as the water conducts the heat from the body into the colder water. Interestingly, this is why clothes actually, well, one of the main reasons why clothes keep us warm. Because round about the body, underneath the clothes, between the outside of the body and the clothes, a layer of air is trapped. And because air is a good insulator of heat, not much heat is transferred into the air surrounding the body. So the fact that air is a poor conductor of heat, in other words, the air is a good insulator of heat, explains largely why clothes keep us warm. So direct contact, air is a good insulator, but a lot of heat can be lost in, in, in water if we're immersed in cold water. Now, heat loss from evaporation is actually included under this heading of conduction. Now, all the time, of course, we're losing water from the surface of the body. Now, just now, I don't feel particularly sweaty, but my skin is actually not exactly... Well, yeah, it is leaking. It, there is a cutaneous loss of water from the surface of the, uh, from the, surface of the body. In plants, we would call this transpiration. So you're actually losing some water from the surface of the body all the time. And as the water that's lost onto the surface of the body evaporates, heat is removed from the body during this process. And in fact about 25% of the amount of heat generated by basal metabolism is lost by this cutaneous loss of water. Of course when we're very hot we sweat, or when we put water on us that water will dry. Now, what I want to explain now is the concept of the latent heat of vaporisation. Now, latent means hidden, and vaporisation means the transfer from a liquid state into a vaporous state. So if you think of sweat, when we sweat, liquid water is deposited on the surface of the body. This liquid water will evaporate when it changes into a vapour. In other words, there will be a process of vaporisation. But that change from a liquid to a vapour is a very um, energy requiring change. It actually takes a lot of energy to transfer water from being a liquid to being a vapour. Energy is required to facilitate that. And the energy that is required to facilitate that change is extracted from the surface of the body as heat. This is why it's called the hidden heat of vaporisation, the latent heat of vaporisation. It is the heat extracted from the surface of the body in order to allow 
the vaporization of any liquids which are on the surface of the body. This applies to sweat.